Um, just wanted to introduce my good friend, Dr. Jim Frazier, who is um, such an inspiration to me and I'm sure will be an inspiration to lots of people. So thank you for joining me tonight and having a bit of a chat about your experience. My pleasure, Rachel. Tell me a little bit about, and everybody else, a little bit about your history working with wildlife. There's one thing I've always realised, and, and I've said it over and over again, is that uh, having the knowledge of wildlife first, uh, you know, I had, when I was quite successful, I had a lot of cameramen approach me and say, oh, I want to be like you, Jim, I want to have a go at wildlife. And my first question would be to them, what do you know about wildlife? Oh, nothing, but I'll learn. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, forget it. Uh, you're not going to ever make it. Uh, mm. So what you, you, your secret would be to have an understanding and patience or what, what's your, your top tips or how do you overcome that technology barrier when you know wildlife? Well, it's a matter of uh, adjusting your technology to suit the wildlife. Some wildlife don't like lights. Uh, uh, others don't like noise. Uh, some don't care at all. Uh, uh, it, it depends on, on the thing. And so I ended up having developing specialist lighting for some insects and some creatures that just didn't like any sort of light. I Way back in the 70s, I filmed sequences in infrared with a spider that didn't like any sort of noise or light, and I had to, I built a whole set on on uh, foam rubber blocks and to isolate it from vibrations of me or any anything or anyone moving around. The slightest uh, touch of either light or sound in that case, uh, this particular spider used to react to a rooster crowing in the distance mm. and you wouldn't see it for the rest of the night so you, you have to respond accordingly uh, and I actually knew that there were sentry hairs uh, on the top of the head of this spider and so I got some latex rubber as a, a liquid and just gently put some on the hairs and that negated the vibration but that still didn't like light. Mm, wow. Uh, so I, I overcame that by shooting in infrared and uh, it had these little rubber peaks on its head, uh, which was the uh, dried rubber, the latex that I'd used. And so it's, it's, it's being able to cope with situations like that and then adjusting the technology, uh, in this case infrared, uh, that I was able to film a major sequence uh, on these uh, spiders. So say for someone going over to Borneo to, um, to shoot the orangutans, what would yep. you suggest there? Would, what would be your advice there? Well, that's a pretty tough call to begin with. One of, one of the, the first rules of thumb there is that uh, it's not a good idea to make eye contact with them. Mm -hmm. You have to be extremely cautious uh, on how you glance at them and how you turn your head sideways as if you're not really interested, but you know, you're there, you're curious, you're, and it doesn't pay to react to any aggressive move they make either because your reaction can be a signal to them as aggression too. And so the attack goes on. Uh, mm -hmm. And would that be if you had a lens, you know, is this the ones that have been <clears throat> have been um, rehabilitated by humans and grown up with humans? Is, well, yeah. the, the first rule of thumb in that case is talk to the people that know them intimately. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll know exactly how you can approach them. Uh, there's a lot of individualism in all animals and... Uh, you can get an animal to do a specific behaviour uh, uh, 99 times out of 100, but there's always that one that will do something different. And it, it's called natural selection, probably. Uh, but you, you always uh, 
are being responsible if you talk to the experts first. And they'll say, well, that's a bit of a cranky one. I wouldn't get too close to that. Uh, some of the females can get uh, uh, more aggressive than the males. Uh, and there is individual temperaments in them. Now, I've not had a lot of experience with orangutans. Uh, I have filmed them. Uh, and I have had experience with a lot of the young ones over there, the rescued ones. Uh, and I'm not really highly qualified on their specific behaviour. But Denzi and I always back point of talking to the experts. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't actually turn around and teach the experts something at the end of the day either. And... Uh, that was the case with that spider where this woman had worked on them for 15 years and uh, we learnt more about the predatory side of them and their behaviour than she'd ever observed because we were willing to set them up in, in, uh, in conditions that she would never have dreamt of unless you were a filmmaker trying to get that sequence. Mm, and what you know with not with um with the insect world but say for the orangutans or for you know elephants or something like that what kind of lenses would be the best in your opinion to just have with you would it you know what what kind of three lenses would you suggest would be the best well there's uh, uh, any any kit you need good telephoto mm -hmm. uh when you want to do stuff at distance or capture the bigger picture uh, by pulling back to a wide angle. There's, there's nothing better than a, a good range in a zoom lens from wide angle to telephoto. Uh, but the ultra wide angle, getting in, getting in close and getting quite dramatic shots is also another way to go. What uh, kind of zoom, what kind of zoom would you recommend? Well, uh, you always, for wildlife, you have to pick the most expensive zooms that uh, will perform well in low light levels. Uh, that means selecting the more expensive lenses that uh, will better able to see in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's no good getting there and saying, oh, it's too dark, I can't film that, I don't have enough stops. Uh, I can't open up wide enough. So that, that's a real problem. Uh, and you can miss a lot of sequences. You, I know you can push the film uh, or you can uh, up the rating on the ASA and all that sort of thing, but it does tend to come out uh, bitsy and grainy. It's better to select faster lenses to do that. And just on the market, would you say, you know, what kind of Canon or Nikon just would do that? What kind of lens in, do you know of any? I, I believe there's an extremely good Nikon available at the moment. Uh, I think it's like 14 to uh, 43, something like that. Uh, that gets you the, the wide angle and the medium sort of telephoto and allows you a lot of flexibility. There's plenty of longer range lenses from 28 to uh, 300, stuff like that now, oh, 40 to 300. I would strongly suggest one of those. Uh, depends, I, I'm a lover of Nikon. I adapted all my Nikon lenses to Cine. Uh, by having a, an adapter built that I designed that fitted my then electronic Bolexes and I could put any of my Nikon lenses on that I so desired because the, the still lenses are a lot cheaper than the cine lenses and the, the high grade zooms and things that they use in them. Uh, but most lenses are pretty good now, uh, especially that... Uh, that Nikon, it's, it's 14, something like 14 to 38 or 35. It's, it's quite an amazing lens. It's come up trumps. Probably is one of the sharpest lenses ever made. Mm, wow, okay. I'll check that one out. 
So another question um, that came up was, um, so how do you interact with wildlife on the screen? Say if there is a tame animal that's still, you know, a wild animal and you're talking on screen, how do you, what's the best way to be on screen or treat that? Uh, obviously be filmed with it mm -hmm. uh, or the vicinity of it. Uh, uh, and better still, interacting with it, uh, mm -hmm. if that's possible. There's, that's, that's where the, the dramatic film is. If you're making the point that this is a wild animal and you've been able to uh, get its confidence that you can get this close to it, that has a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you're got to stay hidden and you can show the person in a hidden state uh, but over the the top uh, of the bush or whatever you're hiding behind you can see the animal uh, that would that would work well with with the cats or uh, the more risky animals uh, you need a form of retreat which you always have uh, you would never go into a situation like that without having some protection or some form of retreat. That would be just ludicrous. If you're dealing with lions or tigers or uh, you're risking a lot, you're putting a lot on the line uh, for the sake of getting a bit of footage. It, at the end of the day, it's not worth it. Uh, you might pull it off a few times. Uh, the next time it might be lethal. Mm -hmm. So would you, what would, what's some common mistakes that you've noticed, you know, with documentary makers these days? Uh, repetitiveness, uh, not getting the nitty gritty footage. Uh, there's nothing better. Now, I don't know whether you saw it the other night. There was a very good doco on ABC on dingoes. No. Uh, it's well worth you digging it out to have a look at. Uh, it's only on this week, uh, or on Saturday night, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy did a, a pretty good job. If you want to learn how to present a story and to present all the different sides of it, he covered it very well. And uh, he talked to the experts. That's the other thing you can do is put the experts on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, because that adds the credibility to what you're doing. Mm. Uh, okay, great, excellent, amazing. Is there anything else that you can think of? You know, what do you find that, as I've talked to you a lot about this before, and I, one thing that stands out to me is that something you said was that you need to have patience of a saint you know being able to be in a tree for three months waiting for a bird to mate or you know have that patience that no one else has is that something you would also say it, uh, patience is the name of the game if you haven't got the patience you you don't want to even start uh patience actually uh patience gives you the material at the end of the day uh but that comes at a cost because while you have vast patience, you're not out there actually shooting a lot of stuff. You're just waiting for it to happen, right? So it's 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 in a way the downside of making wildlife films. But, but patience is the name of the game. And would you say that, um, you know, pressing these days you're pressing record and you're just waiting and you use your instincts a lot, so you're watching a lot and... and well, one, one, one of the huge advantages today that I never had is the case system in cameras where you can set a camera up on some action and the camera does the waiting for you because it's on a permanent 15-second pre-roll. And as soon as something happens, you can hit the start button and you know you've already got 15 seconds covered. So you get the start of the action. Mm. Uh, most modern video cameras have that now. And it, it's an essential, I'd say it's one of the most essential things to be designed in any camera if you're filming wildlife. 
And what about sound? Because, you know, sound I find often something that pe people forget all about. And, you know, right. so do you have any advice about sound when you're doing wildlife? Yes, you need directional sound. Most cameras today are, are too broad. They'll pick up all the stuff, but if you're wanting the particular animal sound, you need to have more directional microphones fitted to the camera so that you know damn well you're getting the thing. It should be divorced from the camera unless it's very well insulated because every time you touch the camera and the camera squeaks, you'll hear it. And that's not a good idea. Every time you touch the button to go on and off on the camera, you'll hear it. And so uh, a separate stand with a directional mic on the stand uh, that's separated by a cord to the camera is a far better option for getting good sound. Do you have a backup when you're on location? Do you have, you know, something, if something goes wrong with the footage, is there a way that you've recorded a backup at the same time these days? Or Yes, uh, with the case system and you can record on a, a hard drive and every night you download it into a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just something you have to do. So you've got a, a clean disc next day. Uh, some cameras have different quantities that you can film before you it has to be downloaded but your computer is a good way to get in and out of countries without people knowing what you've got on in the camera uh, some countries uh, are not easy to get in and out of without you lodging uh, some funding so that in the case that you may do something wrong in that country uh, they're already covered uh, because you've paid uh, an entry fee, basically. Uh, I forget what they call it, but I know that when we went into Borneo, the BBC said, please don't do anything wrong. We've just lodged uh, 90,000 pounds. Mm. So would you say that it's better to get a government approval than to go in guerrilla style or would it be better to go in guerrilla style and wait for all the permits and the government approvals and things like that? Uh, that gets a bit, bit hair-raising, but if, if you do that, you've got to make yourself less obvious with uh, uh, good quality but uh, what looks like tourist equipment. Mm. Okay. And, and you can do it. I mean, there's some extremely good small cameras around that deliver the HD uh, from these tiny little cameras now. So mm. okay. it's all feasible. It's all possible. Uh, you can save yourself a lot of heartaches if you travel on a tourist visa and you're there for a couple of weeks and they think you're in their country spending a vast amount of money. And uh, while you're taking lots of footage... But when it comes to the professional and interviewing uh, the people associated with research and that, that gets a bit sticky then. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. Wow. Is there anything else that you can think of that um, would help somebody that wants to make a difference in the animal kingdom and, and really show what's going on? Uh, join the Sip of the Earth team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where, where their effort is going into uh, such an impact of concept, uh, which is designed to changing the whole world and not just one tiny little aspect of it. So just tell me a bit about Symphony of the Earth while we're here. Okay, well, Symphony of the Earth is a concept that I've had for an awful long time and I've worked up... Uh, and it's, I've came to the conclusion a long time ago that the real heroes of the people of the world are not politicians and heads of government and things like that. Uh, you might notice with them that they're supposed to be our servants, but they're not. Uh, they become dictators or they become uh, obsessed with 
uh, spending your money tax-wise and all this sort of thing. The real heroes of the people are the singers, entertainers, and musicians of the world. If you want to change the world, that's who you use, and you use those very people to put out messages in the lyrics of song uh, to awaken the world, and this is what Symphony Earth is designed to do. And for that, I need 25 wildlife cameramen to go out there and film animals making sounds from crickets to whales, elephants, the whole lot. Uh, and giving those sounds to composers to incorporate into the music so that the animals are adding their voices to the messages. And there are so many problems on the earth with fire, with the seas. Uh, people don't really know about this because even scientists today, if they're not corrupt, uh, scientists are very one track. They're too afraid of speaking out in case they don't attract next year's uh, budget for research. And they don't see the big picture of what's happening on this earth. Uh, I'm divorced from all of that. I've had enough travel. I've seen what's happening all over the world. And I've probably got a better knowledge of what's happening all over the world than uh, uh, ninety nine point nine percent of people on this planet, um, and I have that uh, inner instinct for the way things work naturally. That people who work in offices and uh, uh, in governments just can't identify with, and this is the big problem with uh, with the Earth: is that people have lost uh, touch with things natural. They don't understand it. They don't realise that we're living in a, uh, on a planet in, in peril at the moment. So symphony is designed to deliver all these messages by entertainment. Uh, that's the thrust of it. And by using the highest profile singers and entertainers in the world today uh, and putting it out in 16 languages, uh, and changing the people's heroes from the Western world to whether it be China or Russia or what have you, uh, is the way to get to every person on the planet. Great. Thank you. That's awesome. The, the major thrust that's got to come out of sympathy now is, is love. Uh, it's the highest energy on earth, and it's the, the one single energy that can, change people's uh, uh, whole way of living on this earth. So mm -hmm. uh, that will be incorporated. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim, um, for your chat. Is there anything else or any other comments you'd like to make for any, you know, documentary or change maker out there? Just have a go. Uh, give, it, give it your all. Don't give up. Uh, persevere uh, playing with the tools and not you know letting that be uh, something that stops you would that be something as well yeah be dogmatic be uh, persistent uh, it'll it'll pay off 